Misho, how are you tonight, brother? Hi, my friend. Very well. How are you? I'm, I'm really well as well. Um, you know, today I already had to, two cups of coffee, so I'm actually having a cup of tea with me. Uh, what about yourself? It's a, it's, it's a really, it's a really, really special cup. It's the narcissistic version of myself. Uh, if, if I, if I forget at some point in my life that I'm awesome, I bought a cup that's really pathetic. But it's a special cup because it's a 750 milliliter cup. You can actually pour in a whole bottle of wine. A whole not bottle. I, not yeah, 750 milliliters. It's, it's pretty big. Yeah, not that I've ever done it, but you can if you want to. Hey, look, anything can happen. You know, you could be in a very <laughs> strange situation, so you have to be ready for, for everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, hello everyone who's uh, tuning in right now. I'm here with my friend Misho Stefanov, somebody that I consider first and foremost a happy man. And we're going to dig into all the other interesting stories, backgrounds, and expertise that Misho has. But, Misho, why don't you introduce yourself, share with us, are you always this happy person? <laughs> what makes you happy? And Basically, a little bit about your story, about your, you know, what brought you to where you are today. Uh, well, it, it, it's it's always difficult when when people say, "Please introduce yourself." Um, I'm getting older, and when 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 people ask you to introduce yourself, you're always tempted to start with your CV. I've done this and this, and I'm doing this and this. But recently, probably because I'm getting older. Um, I realized that I, it's really difficult for me to introduce myself uh, through what I'm doing because that's not who I am. I'm trying to, you know, have a, a boundary between, you know, identifying myself with my work um, to 100%. So I'm a father of two awesome ladies. One is six, one is 10. I'm a husband of one wife thank god it's not the opposite you know husband of two and father of one uh um and i've been many things in my life um i've been a musician a mountain guide uh for for a short i even was a manager of a small boxing gym um but currently i have my own consulting company and uh since my background professional is in communications um in the past several years, I, I, I have the, the opportunity and the, the honor to work with leaders from some of the biggest Bulgarian companies and um, train them, advise them in the field of communication. So really shortly, that's more or less who I am. And make sure you've been working for companies, you've been in advertising, working with some of the biggest agencies. Why did you decide to switch careers and start working with teams? empowering teams on leadership on communication uh, what what excites you about what you're doing today well i was i was in 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 pr agencies and big agencies uh, i was a bit too young for the positions that i was in so uh, the stress was a bit too much and the meaninglessness of it all was too much for me um you know Working 16 hours a day to sell sausages or, you know, to advertise uh, beer or um, whatever the case may be. That For some people, that's a dream come true. But I've always looked for, for meaning in my life, for, so like higher meaning. And I've always found this meaning, or part of it at least, in doing things that are beneficial for other people. And um, I remember the difficult decision to switch from my corporate career, which was, you know, it was going up. It was going up and really fast. I was 25 when I was account director in Ogilvy Public Relations. And it was, it was like everybody said, you have such a, such a wonderful life ahead of you. Uh, and I was like, really? Is that the wonderful life? Like, I, it's just I couldn't, I couldn't take it. Um, that was not my deal. So I went uh, to the first big career change I did was I went to the nonprofit sector, which back in the back back in the day was it was it was outrageous. <laughs> Everybody said you're crazy, you know. I, I switched for, you know, almost uh, you know half the half the salary, <laughs> and everybody said you're absolutely insane. 
you know. But I was like, I don't care. Um, my wife always supported me in these crazy moves. And I spent three years working in a children's nonprofit, an amazing organization, uh, working for child rights. Then I spent three more years in an international organization uh, doing preven human trafficking prevention, which was probably the most difficult job that I've ever hold, uh, held. And uh, then I left the, this organization and I five years ago, I created my own consulting company. And uh, I was doing in the beginning some uh, communication projects like more traditional PR and stuff. And, and I was teaching and training. But the more time went by, the more I felt that my heart was in, in advising and training and helping people because I could see the immediate result of my work. Because in, in professional communications, in PR, you don't really see the effect of your work because it's it's not really tangible. You, you need to, like you do a, you do a campaign, you, you organize it well and you get a gold in the end by the, the professional, the PR organization, whatever the case may be. But then you don't see the effect on people, you know. So wh whereas in teaching and consulting, you can see the, the, the effect in people right away. You can see as one of my one of my favorite people in the world, Benjamin Zander says, you can see their eyes shining. And uh, this is this is really really great. And I've always loved people. People have been really, really really high on my agenda. Talking to people, discovering who they are. I've always been really curious about people. So that's it was not it was not a difficult transition the second time uh, when I switched from communications to training. It was a natural thing. The the first time when I switched from a really, really, really successful, whatever that meant, uh, corporate career to, to a career in a nonprofit world. But this was the best move I've ever made in my career. <clears throat> Do you remember your your first paid gig as a, as a trainer and you know, <clears throat> consultant? Well, I'm still not a classical trainer. Um, I'm more of a consultant. The, the way I approach the way I, I've, I've always loved to explain things to people. And if you're a communicator, I mean, if you're a good communicator, it's one of the main things you actually do. You explain complex things using words that people who listen can understand. So uh, I believe this is, this, is the, this is the foundation of good teaching. Actually, this is what you need to do. You have to explain to your students the complex realities in such a way that you move not only their mind, but also their hearts so that they can learn in a true fashion. And uh, I've always been really frustrated and irritated by my, my teachers in university and, uh, you know, back, back, back in the day at high school, because I could see back then that they were not explaining this in an efficient way. And I was really irritated because I was like, this is so obvious. It is so, so I've always had this, you know, uh, say ability or a skill or I'm not sure, a gift or whatever to explain things to people. So it, uh, teaching, teaching has always been easy for me in this aspect. Of course, I had to, you know, upgrade my, you know, the way I teach in terms of uh, processes, in terms of approach, in terms of all of that. But um, I've always been a communicator in, in my heart and who I am. So uh, I, I can't really remember one situation when, when I had to, when it was really difficult. No, 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 no. Uh, if, well, what was really difficult was working a meaningless job. That was really difficult. Teaching people for me is just like communicating and having fun and, you know, trying to explain to them complex realities with simple words. <clears throat> and I got to say, We'll go and we'll talk about communication. I can't, can't wait to dig into that. But last week we were together in the mountains, just, you know, in this beautiful mountain <laughs> hut. I was working. You were enjoying life, I can say. <laughs> and, and really, like, every time I see you, man, and I'm going to repeat it again, you just seem like this happy person. Um, and before we get into this, uh, you know, great topics about team communication, could you could you just share with me, you know, how did you find what makes you happy? I think many people are chasing happiness. They think they're chasing goals, but they're chasing happiness. How did you find your own way that makes you happy and kind of stick with this way instead of trying to fulfill the social expectations or, or all these other things? 
Uh, wow, this is such a such a big question, my friend. Uh, as Bulgarian politicians say, thank you for this question. Uh, they are trying to make some room to think about what they can answer. <laughs> um, I don't think it's an easy answer. First of all, I'm not always happy in terms of, you know, um, I think that we mix two notions in our daily lives. I agree that most people pursue happiness. There was this amazing movie in pursuit of happiness uh, with Will Smith. And, um, but happiness, I think, is, a, is, a, is an elusive thing. The more you pursue it, the more you can't find it. Because I think happiness is a byproduct of meaning. Um, and I've always pursued truth. And I know that this in a, in a, in a postmodern society where everybody says, ah, oh, everybody has their own truth, blah, blah. But I, I don't, I don't, get, I don't think, think about these things seriously. Like, I mean, that's not really serious. Um, I love philosophy and, um, <clears throat> and I've always pursued truth. So I believe that when, when you pursue truth, this is a really unhappy journey, actually. It makes you, it, oftentimes it makes you unhappy. It makes you, you know, uncomfortable. It makes you doubting. It makes, it, it makes you a lot of things. But uh, when you start discovering truth uh, and meaning, then you suddenly become happier <clears throat> without looking for happiness. Because uh, it's, really, it's really otherwise, it's just chasing the wind. Chasing the wind. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, if for me personally, um, I I think that we're mixing the two notions of happiness and joy. We pursue happiness uh, as if it is something that uh, it is an external thing. We want to be happy. We want to be. We want not to have worries. We want to not to worry. You know, we we, we want to we want to have a happy life, a life without problems, without. And this is not real. I mean, this is this is not so. Having joy means that even in problems and battles and difficult situations, you can actually have joy and peace. So this is what I have always pursued: not an easy life without problems, but how can I have this deep, deeply rooted joy, even in the depth of of, of the battles and amidst the darkness which surrounds me from time to time. So I don't want you to have the false impression that uh, I don't have dark moments or I don't have battles. Uh, some of them are really, really deep. Um, and if I pursued happiness, uh, I would have been a really, really disappointed man because these dark moments, they're everything else but happy. But if you pursue truth, then these dark moments, they can help you get closer truth um and so I, I don't know if this answers your question but i think this is the closest thing i can give to an answer uh <clears throat> because some people will say you have to do what makes you happy that's bullshit uh, <clears throat> i apologize that's nonsense that's rubbish because what makes me happy today might be something that destroys my future tomorrow you know I'm just curious now, uh, we speak about teams and, you know, many of the things that you do these days is with helping teams to perform better, to be more effective through communication. H how much do you actually think about the, the actual fulfillment of the employees? Not just the results, performance, but, you know, more like satisfaction and fulfillment of the teams that you're working with. Well... <clears throat> I've, I've never seen, first of all, in terms of leadership, you need to understand my position on leadership. <clears throat> you know, uh, there's a lot being said currently about transformational leadership. And uh, transformational leadership is a great approach. Uh, but uh, there is an Australian professor. Um, I actually contacted him last year. Uh, he has an amazing research. And I, it's, it's a long way, but I'll answer your question. Um, and um, uh, he, he, he researches a different type of leadership that's called servant leadership. And it's a really interesting approach to leadership. Um, and what he discovered is that servant leadership beats transformational leadership on almost every aspect of leadership 
effectiveness with between 8 and 15 percent per indicator. So it's, a, it's an extremely, extremely, it's probably the best approach to leadership ever. Um, so in, what's the difference between transformational leadership and servant leadership? Transformational leadership focuses on the people, but it says um, people are really important because without happy or success or fulfilled or whatever, the, you know, well, without people that have high well-being, we cannot achieve our business goals. So that's that's fine, and I I, I accept that, and I I think that's that's the the minimum level a team should be at. I mean, the leader should understand that without people who are healthy, who are uh, confident, without high levels of trust, without without uh, people who are well, you cannot achieve high results. So transformational leadership practices they focuses on they focus on creating empowering people so that they can do their job in the best way possible. The servant leadership, however does something crazier this for i mean transformation leadership especially for bulgarian uh management culture it, it's it's sci-fi it's 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 crazy it's like it, it's like it, it, you know you, you're spoiling them <laughs> but servant leadership does something even crazier um they say you know we have actually we have two main goals we have our business goals where, yeah, our business goals. But we, the, our second big goal is the, that people are well. So not only do we need people who are well so that we can achieve our business goals. No, the fact that people are well is one of our major business goals. And I think this, this, changes, the, I, I think this changes the whole game, the whole game. Um, of course, it has a lot of, a lot of things in it. It's, you cannot... You cannot easily apply a hundred percent servant leadership approach to to any team because because of many factors. But my personal opinion is that this is a, a standard that we should be striving. Not only you know think about the people are well because they achieve more, but think about the people are well because it's it's one of it's it, you I mean you can have all the foundations all the CSR initiatives if your employees. Are suffering doesn't matter. You are not a responsible employer. You're you're nothing. You know. <clears throat> I love it, man. Uh, really, I love the the way. And I think it what you're saying is in a way, it's a <clears throat> shift in mindset to begin with, and then obviously your actions have to match this new mindset um i don't know if it's sci-fi for the bulgarian companies i haven't really been you know around uh, i spent the last 10 years in denmark and i think it's a little bit different there but in any case corporates have a lot a long way to to go to to kind of shift this mindset into what you were just explaining the servant leadership um and this leads me to a question, you know, mm -hmm. that comes from from uh, last week. Uh, our walk in the mountain and talking about the the way you address and approach working with companies. Imagine I'm a client of yours. You know, I just come to you. I'm like, Misho, we really need to bring you on board, brother. Um, we need to boost our team communication. What are you gonna do? What are the the first steps to to do? in order to start this process of um, of helping this company? Huh. I'll ask a lot of questions. <laughs> um, many times people, when they say they have a problem, they have a different problem. Um, I have met many managers who think <laughs> They, they need to train their teams because their teams are not well prepared. But as soon as we have uh, our first meeting before the training or anything, I, it's so easy to see that actually the manager is the problem. And people are suffering because of bad processes, because of, uh, you know, um, ineffective cultural practices within the company, because there is no trust in the team, because there is no, um, you know, there are no clear communication lines, whatever the case may be. So you see that people don't need training. You know, people need some kind of a, you know, they, they need some kind of change. 
So, uh, well, so to answer your question more seriously, I will do a diagnostic of the team. And this diagnostic includes several tools that I mostly use. Um, it includes in-depth interviews uh, with, the, with the stakeholders, with everybody involved. If the, if the group is bigger, um, I just finished the training for, for an international company uh, of 40 of their R&D managers, including the senior management team. And uh, it, it was an amazing journey, but uh, we did the diagnostics took two months before I started the training. Because um, I think that uh, it is one thing to be a motivational speaker. And I love, I, I love being a motivational speaker. You know, I, it's just like, I love when people invite me just to speak to them. That's, that's amazing. I mean, it's, 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 sometimes I envy you, you know, it's, it's amazing. You know, I just want, and I'm not saying that you're just a motivational speaker, but traveling a lot and just speaking to people, inspiring, that's amazing. Uh, but uh, some of my clients complained once. He complained, he said, I, I envy you. This is what he said. <laughs> he said, I envy you because you come here, you ask us a lot of you know, uncomfortable questions, and then you leave, and we have to deal with finding the answers. <laughs> you know? So I try not to be like this, um, but, uh, you know, so I'll do the diagnostics. Um, and uh, after we did the diagnostics, uh, and which included in-depth interviews, it included two focus groups. It included a survey to all employees so that we can see the employee satisfaction and some areas where management satisfaction was related. We could see where are the areas we needed to improve. And then we combined all of this data and based on that, we designed the training, but it was a, it, it's a specific training. So uh, uh, it's a training that included a lot of practical tools for the managers to work with their teams. Uh, so yeah, yeah, that's uh, it's a lot of work to yeah, prepare. Yeah, it's, well, it's a, it's it's a, it, you you can't do it just you know you can't just go and train them because what is the result and how do you how do you then you know. Um, prove to the management of the company that you have achieved results you know what 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 is the return on investment of this training and why should they invite you again you know yeah because because it's it's not something that's i don't know sales or something measurable right it's yeah. communication it's leadership yeah. you know many many times uh, people relate uh, this to oh the fluffy stuff right the fluffy stuff so um of course, you want to provide some kind of measures and and assess those things, right? Um, what are some of the what are some of the major like if you look into the last couple of years, some maybe trends or the main the same challenges that you keep discovering in in different companies and clients you've been working with when it comes to communication. It is really funny because it's like three or four things everywhere. Um, Many, when we discuss what an effective team is, uh, and we don't have to, we don't have to look really, really deep in the in the literature to find it. Uh, <clears throat> there is, there are several different definitions of team effectiveness, and all of them include at least three factors. First is trust, and trust is always first. So the first issue I almost always find with teams that they have called me and they have said, hey, come here, you know, we're not really effective, whatever the case may be, it, it's almost always some something related to trust. Uh, trust is a really, really, you know, it sounds really simple, but when you when you dig a little bit deeper, uh, trust is a it's really complicated thing. Because there are many factors, some 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 researches reveal up to ten factors that are related to trust form that form trust. <clears throat> for instance, in order for you to trust me, we went to the mountains together, and we, we we haven't met before that. So, in order for you to trust me, you can trust me. Oh, I started training. I'm sorry, man. I'm not answering your question. Okay. So, but anyway, there, there are many, many factors that form trust. So this is number one. Uh, <clears throat> number two. No, no, tell, me, tell me about the mountain thing. You know, you have to finish the example, you know. Okay. We went to the mountain. <laughs> Go ahead. 
Okay, I'm curious so now, you know, you're a storyteller, man. You know, you can't you can't just stop in the middle, you know? Just <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we we went to the mountain and in the first hour or so, you decide if you're going to trust me or not. Okay? And what does this look like in your head? And I'm going to answer. Don't answer. It, it, it was a rhetorical question. Uh, uh, so you actually form trust based on personal trust, based on four categories. Category number one is connectedness. So do I look like a, an open person? Like, you know, do I listen? Do I, do I look like I care about you? That's category number one. Category number two is reliability. Do I look like someone who, you know, who would fulfill their promises? Um, for instance, if, if I had promised to meet you today and speak to you and I didn't show up, you, you probably would still trust my connectedness, although I'm, I'm not sure, but you would definitely not trust my reliability. And you can also, you can also trust me, you trust my integrity. Okay, so, and this is different. Integrity, do I, do I speak behind people's backs? And in our first hour, if I had shown any sign of low integrity, for instance, I discussed in a bad way someone who you, whom you like, you know, then your trust in my integrity would, would go low, even though the other two are okay. And the fourth one is competence. So... Do I am, I am I competent enough to do my job? So in the first hour or so, you form your trust towards me based on these four criteria. But when you go to trust, so you, you see that interpersonal trust is a really complex thing. And it takes a lot of character in order to be trustworthy. Character and professionalism and all of that. So imagine now that you are a leader of a team. All of your people, they form their trust in you based on these four factors, only they have their own different filters to evaluate the data that they receive from your behavior. So being a leader and forming trust is a really complicated thing. And it's easy to break it because your people might trust you that you're competent, but they might think that you're absolutely not connected and you don't care about our other people, which usually is uh, conveyed in the word arrogant. So there is no trust in your team, even though you're competent. And people don't understand this. And you have to, when, when, I, evaluate, when, I, when I measure trust, you, know, you have to go deeper and see what part of trust is broken. And then how do we heal that? How do we, how do we fix it? So I, I have these parameters and I do, do these with, with the teams. And then you go to identity, which is the second component, team identity. And in, inside you have... All sorts of again things that you can measure and you can see the issues, and then you go to efficacy, which is which is more communication, efficiency or efficacy, whatever efficiency. These are the three components of, of, of great teams. So when you say efficiency, you mean efficiency of communication or no, efficiency, efficiency, in terms of efficiency of a team producing efficiency of the team. You, 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 I mean if efficiency is doing the same job with less resources, shorter time, whatever the case may be. So there's efficiency. Efficiency in a team is almost a direct result from communication processes. But efficiency comes last. It's on top. If you don't have trust, it's not possible to have efficiency. And do you do you sometimes find situations where people trust their manager, their, their leader, but they don't trust the structure of the company? Yeah. They don't trust the... When you go to the structure of the company, you have uh, from these four you go to up to 10 parameters that form the trust of an employee to, up to the company. And two of those, if they're broke, sorry, man, everything else is fine, but those two are broke. Trust is really fragile thing. And uh, if it is broken, I mean, even, even if, two, if two parameters are broken, you can still be working for that company for quite a while, but you're not giving your best. Trust is directly related to motivation to engagement levels and all of that and uh, i love going deeper i love i love i love digging into into people and uh, just seeing what they think and how they think because this is what actually i believe trainings should be they should help managers solve their problems this is uh, this is such a you know i want to actually dig deeper but um 
how do we how do we actually like let's say there's a new person coming into the company it's been assigned maybe she or he sees there's a great team here but the trust is not really there you know i'm a new new guy in the house so what what would be some of your kind of you know basic suggestions for 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 this person to to ensure the first maybe couple of months they kind of win the trust and they can have a chance for some sort of a transformation even though i'm not sure you you really like this word but <laughs> you see where i come from hmm so i have to advise the, the person who's joining the team is that correct yes there's a new manager new leader yeah. okay. executive oh, and new leader. Wanna, yes they want to they want to okay. join maybe it's a manager it's a it's an executive they, they they're joining this new team new company the trust in the leadership maybe in this company is not so high you know people are getting by but it's it's not there so this person wants to to really make a nice impression and to build to, to kind of to win the trust of this this employees i i have only one word to say it's just it's a really simple question it's a really simple answer it the word is listen just listen and listening is the most powerful tool that we have so many people when they join a new team they want to position themselves as great experts they want to prove themselves they want to be you know they they, they really want to uh, achieve whatever no you just need to listen to people you just need to listen to your colleagues and when i mean listen i mean listen well you know just go to them show interest in people ask them if if you are a new manager and your team is really experienced then obviously you have to prove your competence but there is a shortcut you don't have to prove your competence by dominating with your competence over them, which is a stupid thing to do, you know, because this is this is how you create enemies. No, you, you just go and you tell these experts that you are going to lead. You tell them, you're the experts and I want to learn from you. Please teach me. You know, and then, then you listen. Actually, winning trust, it's complicated in the background to diagnose where the issue is. But 80% of the cases, listening well solves the issue. Because listening well shows a lot of things. It shows humility. It uh, quiets the, 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 all, the, all, the, all the fears of, of people. Um, it opens the conversation. It shows openness to, to people in general, which is the foundation of trust. Uh, and it shows willingness to change on, on, on behalf of the manager which is, again, a great thing for trust. Uh, because when we discuss trust, what is trust? Trust is actually psychological safety. So if you, if you trust me, this means that you, 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 you feel free to take risks with me, right? You can share information with me because you trust me that I won't use it in, in a harmful way for, towards you or towards someone else. Or you are okay to, to make a mistake when I'm there because uh, you know, it's fine because you trust me. That's what trust is as a, as a product. And listening, careful listening, is the single most important tool when you join a new group because people like to talk about themselves. You give them this opportunity, you win their trust right away. And then, of course, you have to be professional. You have to do your job, whatever the case may be. But that's the first thing you need to start doing. And I guess also when you when you speak about listening, it's not just staying with the person, listening, and whatever you guys discuss, you know, just the next week it, nothing changes or or you didn't remember what they, they really, you know. So um and that's probably you know part of like maybe you can elaborate more on this, um, on the actions that needs to come out of this listening, right? Hmm. Well, my friend, listening is a really active process this is the first thing that we need to understand it's a really active process so listening well takes energy and it's it's a really tiring thing to do because you're actually trying to understand what the person means you're actually trying to understand how the person feels okay so as soon as i listen in such a way i can start seeing things <clears throat> 
one of the big problems that the managers I work with actually they don't see a lot of things that I see not because I'm not I'm smarter than them not in any way I just listen and they don't they think that they listen but they don't because in order to listen you have to stop speaking in your head you can't speak in your head you can't formulate your answers and then listen at the same time that's impossible perhaps for some ladies it is but for most people it's not because women you know they, they can multitask or, or they think they can uh, um, <clears throat> ladies i apologize but there is a really solid amount of neurobiology but neurobiological research that proves that even you can can't multitask but that's a subject of a different talk uh, <laughs> but uh, when you listen well you suddenly understand that this person feels worried you understand that they'll feel uncomfortable you see that there is a problem so what, what is the problem you ask a question that's part of listening no that there is no problem oh really oh that surprises me because i feel you're somehow you know worried about something and then you pause and then you give them an opportunity to share and if they don't share you share a story about how you handled the problem how you had the same problem a year ago and how you made a mistake and they're oh it's safe because this guy speaks about his mistakes then it's safe that i share and then you do three or four things to show that you're actually willing to listen because people they don't trust because nobody listens to each other these days and uh, listening to someone else is probably the best compliment we can pay to each other and uh well but we we rarely do it because we are so self self-centered and uh <clears throat> and when people when you listen well people in the beginning they don't trust you because they, 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 they're not used to someone listening to them this way. But once they understand that you listen well, that you care about what they want to say, and that when you listen well, you take notes and you go and change stuff, <clears throat> everything changes for good. You know, I, I have a great example. One of the first guests on my podcast, a very good friend, uh, an Irish guy, Patrick Hamilton Walsh. Um, He's a great listener, man. I'm just so impressed. He will ask you a question. Like, literally, he, I've been with this guy, you know, met him in different countries. He goes, he meets a homeless person, and he's like, yeah. how are you, brother? Uh, I I love your shirt. I love your jacket. He starts, you know, just giving him honest and sincere praise. And then he's like, he's asking questions. Two weeks later, he will, he will remember that his wife left him or whatever, and he will be like, how is this thing that we spoke about? It, sometimes I'm, I'm impressed. Like six months later, he calls me. Hey, brother, how did it go with the project? I'm like, wow, he remembers, man. Like it was six months ago. Um, so, Patrick, if you're watching, brother, uh, thank you for being such an example, such an inspiration. Um, it's really, it, it really makes people special. Yeah. When you see them, when you, when you really care. Yeah, when you really care for the other person. Um, and especially if you're their subordinate, if you're their manager, and, and you don't really care for only about the results that they produce, which is important, but you care for them as, as, as a human being. <clears throat> it's a part of the, the kind of like the family of this company. So, um, and, you know, we have one one of the chapters of, of the book that uh, uh, we are... Um, finishing right now with my co-author is called Robust Communication. And, and we spent uh, actually a lot of time discussing the topic of feedback um, and how important for somebody working in a team is to receive feedback. Uh, there's a multiple researches that I, I came across that show that people, people love feedback, not just the positive feedback, but also constructive feedback of what should be improved. And uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Like, do you sometimes uh, have to teach teams how to give feedback, but also how to receive feedback? It, it is some part of what I do, but it's, it's, not, a, it's not a major, it's not a central part. It's, it's a communication tool. I think it's really, really important to be able to do it well, you know, especially in work environment. But it's also really, really important to to be able to do it well with our children. Uh, the 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 so I would say I do, and in some of the trainings that uh, we do, I 
record lessons and um, talk about feedback. But I'm not sure I have some innovative approaches to giving feedback. But to your question, I would say it's really important. <laughs> it's really important. Um, I think feedback is part of, um, you know, I have a favorite metaphor for, for leaders and for, for managers. And it's the metaphor of, 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 of a gardener. Um, you know, uh, you can see the world in basically societies all over the world. They see the world in one of two metaphors, using one or two, one of two metaphors. First metaphor is mechanistic. So they see the world as a machine. Most cultures in the world, however, they see the world in organic metaphors. So they would say the world is like a river or a village or whatever the case may be. So I, I really love organic metaphors when we speak about leadership because the mechanistic ones, uh, they're a bit not human, you know, they're a bit mechanistic. But I love the gardener metaphor because, you know, the garden, you have to take care for the trees, you know. You go out there and you, you clean the bugs and you dig around them and um, stuff like that all year. You know, all year long. And then they, you know, they bear, they bear fruit once per year. So I love this metaphor. I think that, uh, of course, we can't expect our employees to be productive once per year. But it's not really realistic to, to expect without us doing the gardening for them to be fruitful throughout the year. Um, it, that's not really realistic. That's, that's a machine. And human beings, they're not machines. Um, there's something different, I think. In my, in my worldview, there's something different. So, so my friend, I hope, I hope this, to some, extent, uh, to some extent, answers your question. Feedback is a process of gardening. Okay? So I will cut this branch and cut this branch and cut this branch. But I'm not cutting the tree. On the contrary, I'm trying to make the tree give more fruit. Okay. It's a corrective action that sometimes hurt. You know, it, 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 it's not it's not pleasant. You know, what are you doing with my branches? You know, I love this branch. You know, I got it last autumn, whatever the case may be. But then next year you're going to, you know, you're going to have more fruit because you can have the energy focused into the branches that give fruit. So I, I, I think feedback is it, it's really like this if if you like the metaphor if you don't like it then find another one but it's this is how i see it it's vital and it's painful but if done well people get really 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 productive <clears throat> you know what i love about uh, your communication style actually the first time i met you was the abo activator and you you were teaching storytelling and storytelling in, in a business context and how can we use storytelling to to make teams more effective so why stories are so powerful and and how can we use them actually in business i think people many people are struggling to understand yeah okay storytelling is great but why should that be something effective for for teams for business like okay uh, well, it's because they come from the mechanistic world of business, where businesses are these big machines, and uh, there is no place for a story in a big machine. But uh, as I say, humans are not machines. Um, uh, so when you dig deeper, because we said we're going to dig deeper today, when you dig deeper into human, into humans, into people, regardless of the culture, you find. The, the person is like an onion. Here's another metaphor for you. Okay, an onion. So on the on the on the outside, you've got the, the, the someone's behavior. But when you start start digging deeper, you've got their thoughts and then their feelings and whatever the case may be. And then at the very heart, you've got their worldview. Okay. So everybody, each of us has their own worldview, and it's a, it's a combination of several of several things that. Actually, we don't think about them. Most, most of the time they're unconscious, but we think through them. So they're our eyeglasses through which we see the world, through which we answer the big questions of life. Everybody has this. So every culture in the world you can discover by 
asking the, the seven eight or eight questions from the world view framework and you can understand how they think uh so uh, when i when i say that uh it's people throughout the world from all the cultures like regardless of culture regardless of age they use two main tools to explain the world the first in order to understand the world they use analogies metaphors and i've been doing this throughout our conversation giving feedback is like a tree the person is like an onion whatever the case may be because this is how this is how we humans we understand things that we do not know for the first uh, for the first um uh physicists who, who discovered the the atom the atom looked like the solar uh universe like the solar system they said oh that's like the solar system okay but it's not but it's like it okay this is how we explain stuff so if you use metaphors in the way you communicate you actually help people first of all understand and then you help them remember it's really simple it's not a, it's not rocket science it's about actually doing it <laughs> and then stories um is the second powerful tool that we humans use all the time we use metaphors to understand the world and then we 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 we, we sort of intertwine these um metaphors in a big story in order to make sense of the world so stories give us meaning so when you ask me why should we use stories in business I, I would answer well if you don't sell to people don't use stories if you don't use people to work in your teams don't use stories if you don't uh, if you don't try to encourage people to do something don't use stories but if you work with people with human beings you have to realize that the story is one of the deepest mechanisms operating within them regardless of their nationality race age where regardless of where around the world they're born they operate on stories and that's so deeply ingrained in human nature that i really don't understand how you can not be using stories when you work with people or when you try to sell to people that's the only communication tool that actually works And if you are an engineer or something really rational and logical, but you're listening to the podcast right now and you're like, I need to start using yeah. stories. <laughs> like, what would be some some for kind of like a suggestion to somebody to, you know, like to what is a good story? What for for somebody who's not been really a storyteller, so to say? Everybody's a storyteller, too young. What are you saying? I mean. You and I, uh, please excuse me for, uh, you know, pardon me for my uh, example, but you get drunk on Friday and on Sunday, you tell the story to your friends. Even if you're a physicist, you do it, okay? You know, and they all laugh at you. That's storytelling. We, we, we tell stories all the time. I, I, I don't think storytelling is such a big deal. I mean, I, I understand that it's trendy right now with business and all that, but I tell my clients, it's like, story you've done storytelling all your life you do storytelling with your children with your spouse with your partner with your with, with, you do storytelling in the office all the time like you hey guys you know i, I found this bar and oh, it was amazing found this restaurant how, how was your trip how was your holiday and then you start telling them a story why because this is how you convey meaning and suddenly when we start speaking about business things we switch to boring facts I don't understand this. Many people yeah, say, well, in my work, there is nothing interesting to tell a story. No, that's not true. Even if you're a developer and or, or, or nuclear you know, physicist, whatever the case may be, you've got the story. And that's your story, the person working on this project. You have your challenges. You have your ups and downs. You have, your, you have the failures that you have learned a lot of lessons from. And you have your story. You are the story. So that it's not difficult. You just have to, you know, start thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, and so some of the most amazing pitches I've seen have been including stories, yeah. not just pure facts and you know. Yeah, like, of course, uh, of course, yeah, 
Of course, you need to have the numbers and the rationale behind it. You can't just live on stories. But if you want to get the attention and really the heart of the person, story is a great tool. Um, well, yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I agree absolutely. <clears throat> so we have a question coming from YouTube. Um, Woohoo! Yay. Uh, so Anya is asking, um, she's saying, hello. What are the challenges and opportunities for many teams working remotely? due to a sudden crisis. What is the future of remote teamwork? Thank you, Anya, for this question. Um, well, <laughs> the future of remote teamwork is a sad future. Uh, sorry to say that. Human beings are not designed to operate in loneliness. Uh, so uh, I think companies should urgently, urgently uh, think about measures. How will they overcome the serious depression that is going to sweep through our ranks in the next several years? And if they're not seeing it happening right now or beginning, they're probably blind and should seek a different job. Um, of course, there are things you can do in a remote, remote team to improve trust and to uh, improve engagement and motivation. And of course, if you're located all over the world um, and you've always worked like that, you just understand that there is a certain level that you can reach. You cannot go beyond, okay? But if, if we have a team that, have, that has worked together and they have you know, formed friendships and it's like losing your mother, it's, I mean, the, 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 the amount of grief, the amount of frustration and loneliness that people feel can, can be compared to losing someone that's really, really like losing them for real. So uh, people grieve without understanding that they're grieving. And I see people focusing on, uh, yeah, we can work from home. Yeah, results are great. Wait, wait a little bit because... You know, these things, they develop in the long run. And uh, not that I want to be a you know, negative person or bad prophet, but I think it's, it's really, really urgent for companies to start training managers in, uh, in basic facilitation, in basic, uh, you know, recognition of, um, of, of basic psychological health issues to their employees and, and even like developing programs so that their employees, they have access to, to counseling and, you know, deep stuff. Because let me tell you something. One of the things that I really dislike is the self-help industry. Uh, and I have my reasons, of course, my deep reasons. Um, and uh, if you allow me a, a sad story, a lesson learned. Um, I had a, I used to have a blog several years ago. And back then I was focused on getting more viewers. Um, you know, this is this is what the world teaches. You know, you have to do content that attracts more people, and you constantly think about how to attract more readers, how to make so that more people see you. And you you're a slave to this, you know, this moreness and muchness and manyness of of this. So one of the articles I found an amazing article, English article. It was uh, the headline was 30 things that we should stop doing immediately," and I liked it. Oh man, 30. Amazing self-help, uh, you know, advices. Stop worrying. Stop uh, being negative towards other people. Stop uh, wasting time for unimportant things and so on. So this is such a cool self-help tool. And I translated it and I posted it. And man, it, it generated only in the first month, it generated something like, I don't know, eight, 9,000 unique visits to my blog. Such a success. I was, wow, this is unbelievable. Like, I have to find another article like this. And, you know, you get all the marketing uh, boxes. You start ticking them. And, and then one lady posted a comment under this article. And she said, one of my friends, closest friends, this was the last article she shared on her wall before committing a suicide. And it was such a big shock for me. And I just stopped there and I was like, what am I doing? 
Of course, it was not my fault that this lady committed suicide. Uh, but then I started reading this article from the eyes of someone who is in a depression, who is experiencing uh, what one of the Christian saints from the middle century says, uh, he calls the dark night of the soul. You know, dark, dark, hard periods. And I realized that this is poison for such people because they feel so powerless. They cannot do even one of the 30 rules. And suddenly you feel you feel lost. You feel, you know, you cannot help yourself when you're in a depression. You need someone to talk to. You need a good friend to listen. Okay. And then I decided that self-help works only for people who are well, which means that it does not work for anybody because when you're well, you don't need it. And when you have serious soul issues, it's it's counter counterproductive. So um, I really don't like self-help ideas. I think we should be digging deeper, thinking harder about life's questions and um, facing the reality of life and try and find and, and form good relationships by being generous and being open to people and um, being patient and being less self-centered if possible. Um, and I know these are really hard things to do, but um, I think that companies, if they want to, if they want to overcome the, 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 the human crisis that comes, uh, they need to focus on human character and not only on skills and self-help advices. <clears throat> These are some really truthful words, brother, and I really appreciate uh, you kind of not giving us the, you know, the, the politically correct, uh, positive, uh, you know, like everything is good kind of answers, but actually the how you feel about it and what what the reality in your view is about this kind of thing. And, you know, I don't know if you might be able to offer some ideas, but again, many, many companies, many people are forced these days to be working from home to to be in a lockdown some people in some countries cannot go anywhere but to the grocery shop or back home mm -hmm. um what would be maybe some just practical ideas suggestions for for people who are working from home starting to feel this pressure this tension uh on you know on the mental side <clears throat> well my friend, I, I really, I'm, I'm not really, a, you know, a counselor in this aspect, um, and um, I really hate giving advice when I'm not a, really an expert in the field. Uh, but uh, it's 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 really really difficult. And first of all, I would say that I hear them, and I understand because I I've felt the same way, and I've been through my dark nights of the soul, and um, I think it's. Uh, it's in these moments when when we need love from people that are around us. And um, it's it's really difficult. It's really, really difficult. I'm afraid, for myself personally, um, I'm a Christian. So in these moments, I pray. Uh, and, um, and I know this is not an advice I can give to everyone. <laughs> because obviously, we all stand somewhere in our relationship to faith or religion or whatever the case may be. Uh, but uh, but I would say I would say we need love, and uh, we need to ask for love and ask for help. When I say love, I don't mean you know any sort of weird uh, go on porn tube because they have their porn hub, they have their new. No, I mean human connection, someone that would listen. And I feel loneliness is one of the biggest issue of our times. We are so connected and so lonely. It's terrible. So the only thing I can give them as an advice, find someone that can listen and just share. Um, share as much as you can. Share as if, much I can as you. if I can expand on this, <clears throat> find somebody that can listen or be somebody that listens. Yeah. Become yeah. the person that gives a hint and says, hey, how can I help you? I just yes. called you. I just <laughs> called you because I wanted to say that I thinking of you and i want you to know that whatever is going on i'm here do you need anything how can i help you 
you know yeah. i i agree it's just sometimes sometimes you, you you can't do even that it's sometimes you're so lonely and so you know it's so difficult so i would say if you can do it do it because it's a human connection and when you give you usually receive uh and that's a good thing but if you can't do it ask for help you know and it, it don't ask, don't, yeah don't it, ask on facebook because when people like your post when they send you a virtual hug that's not a hug at all that deepens your loneliness try and have a human connection you know try and touch someone if, if there is nobody to be to be touched call someone over the phone to hear their voice you know cry with someone <clears throat> we should thanks so much man like this i think it's a, such a great place i think to to kind of wrap this thing up and and maybe have a you know part two uh in the next few months uh when the heart has connected <laughs> once again but uh yeah definitely i think it's a, such a great and beautiful message uh, to really reach out for help and i, I gotta tell you man I, I i myself when i'm not feeling well the last thing I want is to bother somebody else with, uh, like, when I'm in a good place, I'm like, I want to talk to everybody. But uh, so it's very hard actually to reach out for help. But but in these times, it's it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. People who, who love you, they actually will will be happy to to be there for you in in, in difficult times. So uh, thank you, so Michel. Now, my friend. You've got my number now. So please, next time you feel like you don't want to bother somebody. I love being bothered, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not probably not as a good listener as your Irish friend, but I can listen. <clears throat> so don't hesitate to to call me. I love you, brother. Thank you so much for this and for, Thank you for just uh, me sharing uh, sharing all this. And just final question, Misho, where could people find you? You know, connect with you. Maybe somebody listening now is uh, interested to say, "Hey, we want to bring Misho in our team and and see if we can." you know, make things a little bit different here? Well, uh, I have a website, michostefanov.com, uh, but it's only in Bulgarian. Uh, it's a bit sad, but uh, yeah, they can find my email there. Uh, otherwise, on LinkedIn, I'm, I'm really easily, you know, discoverable. Uh, <clears throat> so um, I'm pretty open and I, I love to chat to people. So even if you don't want to uh, bring me on your team and, you know, whatever the case may be, I, I just love talking. So just you can you can just chat with me. <laughs> this, is, this is something that uh, we share. Uh, both of us love to talk. Um, but I hope to believe we also love to listen. So uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Misha, for sharing thank all these uh, beautiful thank stories. And everybody who just uh, been with us, thank you for being with us. And hopefully there were some interesting insights and stories. It will be it would mean a lot to us uh, if there was one thing that was really important for you. If you share it in the comments, let us know how you're feeling. If there is anything we can support you with. And yeah, have a great evening. Uh, Bye, guys. <laughs>